So Manchester by the Sea is the third feature by Kenneth Lonergan. Um, and Kenneth Lonergan made You Can Count On Me back in 2000, which was a Sundance Festival favourite and got great reviews and a couple of Oscar nominations. And then he's a playwright. Uh, he was best known originally as a playwright. And he'd, he got, um, uh, he's got screenwriting credit on Analyze This. And uh, he made You Can Count On Me on, you know, absolutely under his own terms. And people said, wow, the guy's a genius. And I like You Can Count On Me, N not as much as some others, but I liked it. Then there was Margaret. He shot Margaret in 2005. And it then went into post-production hell for six years of fighting and uh, trying to get it finished and trying to edit it and uh, lawsuits. And one thing or another, the film finally came out in 2011 in a version which I have to say still looked unfinished. It still looked like a work in progress. There were lots of stories about Scorsese being brought in to help finish the film. It had some great performances and it had some strong elements, but it was, yeah. So when uh, Manchester by the Sea came out, it, the feeling for me was, OK, come on, now demonstrate that you are the great genius that everybody says you are. And with a, with a couple of false steps aside, this is the one. This is the one that goes, OK, this guy does know how to make a film and he does know how to, you know, how, how to tell a story. So the story is uh, Casey Affleck plays uh, this uh, janitor who is uh, working uh, in a suburb of Boston and is incredibly uh, withdrawn. Uh, he's called Lee. We see him dealing with everybody's plumbing, but he won't be friendly. If somebody, somebody says to him, you don't say hello, you're, you're not friendly, you don't smile at them. There is obviously some terrible baggage uh, in his past that he is carrying with him. Um, and we see him go to a bar one night. He won't talk to anybody. People try to start him in conversation, but what he will do is later on in the evening, having been drinking alone, he gets into a fight and starts punching people. So there is like this kind of silent scream of rage inside him. He then gets a phone call that says his brother has collapsed in Manchester by the sea and he needs to go back to the hometown, a place where obviously dark, you know, something, something in the past is waiting for him. And when he gets to Manchester, he discovers that he is now going to have to look after his nephew, um, despite the fact that he has essentially severed all emotional ties with everyone around him and is living an isolated existence. I don't understand. Which uh, part are you having trouble with? Well, I can't be his guardian. Well, uh... I mean, I can't. Well, naturally, I, I assumed Joe had discussed all this with you. No. He didn't. No. Uh, I, I, so I have to say I'm somewhat taken aback. He can't live with me. I live in one room. <laughs> well, but Joe has provided for Patrick's upkeep. Food, clothes, etc. And the house and the boat are owned outright. I can't commute from Boston every day until he turns 18. I think the idea was that you would relocate. Re relocate to where? Well, if you yeah. look, it's it, well, as you can see, you know, your brother worked everything out extremely carefully. Uh, but for, he can't have, yes, he can't uh, have meant that. So basically, he finds himself in a circumstance in which he is being dragged back into the past, dragged back to the town which he has left, dragged back to being intimately connected with people having withdrawn from the world. One of the great strengths of the film is that Ben Affleck, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, Casey Affleck, because uh, we were talking about Ben Affleck just earlier on, does one of the most impressive portrayals of isolation and withdrawal I can remember. When you try, when you play characters who are sort of isolated and withdrawn, too often people just do that thing about, you know, they, they look away or they blank stares. What Casey Affleck does is to give you a sense that Lee is absolutely a, a kind of a deadpan, calm surface with something raging, broiling just beneath the surface. And it's to do with tiny physical gestures. It's to do with the way in which he hunches his shoulders. It's to do with this almost imperceptible pursing of the lips and this strange display of his teeth. It's to do with the way in which his eyes dart around the room. And it's a really impressive performance. I mean, it is really, really good. And what the film then does is it divides its time between the modern day stuff in which he's having to go back to Manchester with the sea, he's having to deal with his estranged wife, he's having to deal with Joe's estranged wife, he's having to deal with this teenager who he 
you know, knew and loved as a kid, but from whom he has apparently become estranged and who now appears to be himself a rather difficult, selfish teenager who is obsessed only with his own libido and his own life. Imagine that. Imagine that. And these scenes are juxtaposed against scenes of his old life, of his life uh, with his wife before, played by Michelle Williams, in which he's completely the opposite, in which he's garrulously outgoing, in which he's almost sort of boorishly drunken and full of bonhomie, and he's, oh, friends, yeah. And these two separate timelines are juxtaposed against each other, and you get the sense that they are going to meet in, you know, whatever it is, the dark secret that's kind of hiding in the in the back of the film, which you have some, you have some sense of what it is. I mean, obviously, he's become estranged from his wife, and how has that happened? Um, but the way in which... Affleck's performance negotiates the difference between those two parts of the character's life is really, really beautifully done. The poster, I have to say, shows you Michelle Williams and Casey Affleck and suggests that the film will actually be about their relationship. In fact, one of the, the flaws of it for me is that she is rather sidelined. And what that means is that when you get certain confrontations in the drama, I actually wanted to know more about her character. I wanted to know more about what happened to her character. I wanted more of what I thought, to some extent, the film was being sold by in that poster. And so I ended up thinking something which I almost never think, which was, I wish this film was half an hour longer. And I never say, I mean, you know this, I never say that. Yeah. I, I actually wanted there to be more fleshing that out. There is another false step, which I... I I think is important, which is that there is a central sequence, which is a really, really important sequence about the character's emotional life and about how they've got to where they are now and how they got from where they were. And it's uh, a very, very well orchestrated sequence and it's really powerful, except for the fact that um, Kenneth Lonergan has decided to accompany it with Albinoni's Adagio in G minor. Oh. And the problem with that is Albin on Adagio and Jimmy has been overused so much in popular entertainment that when it turns up, it's distracting. Um, I have to say, to, to give him his credit, he did say in an interview that he, originally he put it on as a temp track, just a temporary piece of music, and he was always intending to replace it. And then he just thought, it works so well, I can't replace it. And it may be that not everyone has the same, but for me, as the minute I hear that piece of music, I think, Butterflies, Wendy Craig, I think Rollerball, I think Gallipoli, I think Simon Mayo's Confessions on Radio 2. I do use that every And day. the reason you use it is because it's a, it has now become a cliché. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like, a particularly in a film which was so much to do with nuance, I mean, when I was talking about Casey Affleck's performance, I was saying so much of it is to do with tiny gestures, that it just seemed like a, a like a trowel like thing to just lay on this piece of music, which you know is a brilliant and superb piece of music, but is overused in popular entertainment. No two ways about it. And Lonergan knows that, and he knew it when he decided to keep the piece of music on. And it may be that it's not a problem for everybody. For me, it was like the sound of a ship docking in the back, and I found that very very distracting. It, it says something about how good the film is that it didn't derail it completely for me. Because actually, the minute that that piece of music was gone, I was back into the, you know, the emotion of the film. And, and I thought that it had, it has a chilly look. It's set, it has a wintry setting. I mean, it's frosty. It's not just his character that's frosty. There's snow on the ground. There's ice in the air. There is ice in the relationships between the characters that you hope may thaw. It's a film which also has a certain degree of um, black comedy about it. It's a film which is very much about the incidental details of life being the things which are important and defining. At some of its most harrowing moments, everything is reduced to bureaucracy and pen pushing and people struggling with doors and things which are so unbelievably mundane. And this is something that Lonergan does brilliantly. He absolutely has an, an eye for the mundane details. So overall, it's the piece of work that demonstrates that he is as good as everybody thinks he is. I don't think it's perfect. And I, you know, as I said, that music choice and the, the absence for me of more of Michelle Williams' character, those are missteps, but those are in the end incidental missteps that do not take away from the fact that it is a very powerful film about an isolated man, brilliantly played by Casey Affleck, and directed with, genu with a genuine cinematic feeling by Kenneth Lonergan, about whom I am now, okay, 
yeah, he is good. 